Welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to the uh, Format High Tech Creators uh, Roundtable. I'm joined by uh, fellow Format High Tech Ambassadors. Um, just a little bit about us. Format High Tech uh, is the manufacturer of the world's best filtration. So across photography, cinematography and videography, uh, what we do, we do world class. And a little known fact, um, something we're very proud of is that all of our products and systems are actually manufactured here in Wales, in the South Wales Valleys of Aberdeen. So um, we're very proud of the fact that we are a UK company and a Welsh company at that. I'm joined today by um, some of the industry's finest. In actual fact, in our opinion, the industry's finest uh, range across a number of fields from uh, Lewis Adams, who's a, a very well-known and high-performance cinematographer, uh, Josh and Trio Sow and Bart, uh, who are known creatives across multiple fields, uh, Emily uh, Lowry, who's uh, dominating the field of micro four-thirds, in, in our opinion, and um, professional photographers Dibs McCullen, Courtney Victoria, and James Fortune, who, uh, across a various range of both photography and videography, uh, have, have got a whole host of talents. So uh, we're here today to discuss different elements. We will be taking a live Q&A um, from both socials and uh, the audience, of which uh, thank you for those who are attending. There's uh, not as much as we anticipated. So um, without further ado, guys, I don't know if you want to just um, give a little intro of yourselves and uh, your specific fields, just in case I, I missed something. So, no? Okay, so my name's Josh. Um, I do corporate videography mainly. That's my main sort of bread and butter stuff. So filming for, you know, big companies that have net worths of like 500 million and upwards. Um, that's my main sort of work. And I also do YouTube about Lumix cameras and about basically how that system in of itself has grown in the last three years to be one of the most dominant uh, systems currently on the market. So, yeah. Hi, I'm Lewis. I'm a cinematographer by trait. But in 2020, I started my own production company and we make everything from music videos to short films to commercials. Uh, hey everyone, I'm Bart. Uh, I'm Sal. We are Sal and Bart from Trio Stories. Yeah, we're a creator couple, um, filmmakers, YouTubers and photographers. And we run our own production company, Trio Stories. That's who we're under today. And yeah, we make uh, short films. We work with a lot of brands all around the world. That kind of stuff, yeah. You have a life. Hi, I'm Dibs McCallum. I've uh, travelled over from the east of England and I mostly focus on landscape photography. Uh, I've got a background in commercial, but over the last couple of years, especially since COVID, I've really decided I want to focus more on my landscape work because that's where my passions 100% lay. And yeah, I'm just here. If anyone wants to catch up for a chat at any point, always up for a conversation about landscape photography. So feel free. I'm Emily Lowry. I'm a micro four thirds shooter. I do wedding photography and videography. And I also really love travel and street photography, which is what I tend to share on my YouTube channel. Hello, my name is Courtney Victoria. I'm a landscape photographer and YouTuber. So on YouTube, I make videos about the behind the scenes of my landscape photography. I like to focus on the creative side of photography. Otherwise, I teach photography through workshops, presentations, and talks. Hi, I'm James Fortune. I'm uh, primarily a landscape and corporate commercial photographer. I do occasional bit of video as well. Uh, the corporate stuff seems to be taking up most of my time at the minute, so the commercial stuff. I'm doing sort of things like environmental portraits, products, etc. And uh, yeah, it's keeping me out of trouble anyway. Thank you, guys. Um, so just another quick Round of applause for those because it has a nice introduction. Thank you very much. Um, so we're here today. We want to discuss some hot topics. Uh, the guys, we've all come together in, uh, to discuss and finalize topics that we think are affecting the field that will uh, pretty much be aspects that we are maybe all thinking about. And uh, these guys are leading the way with in their field. So uh, we figured it'd be good for everyone to find out what the industry leading professionals actually think about in, in terms of where things are heading. So to kick it off, hot topic, maybe a touchy one as well. Uh, some people think it's quite threatening, but um, how do you guys, so I put it to, to you first, um, think that AI specifically, I think I heard someone boo then, um, how do you think AI is affecting the industry or how do you think it will affect the industry? Um, Lewis, I'm gonna pick on you because I know you've, uh, You've got a particular view on this. How do you think AI is affecting the industry? How do you think it will affect the industry moving forward? Um, 
Yeah, with certain aspects. We've not so I just made a music video where we used AI to edit. Uh, we obviously had to lay everything out on a storyboard beforehand, but for the visual effects, we used AI. I use AI in my day-to-day -day life, replying to emails, helping me create code. I think as a solo sort of producer director, it's amazing. For the industry as a whole, it's challenging to know where it's going to go in the next five to 10 years. How many jobs is it actually going to take? And I think for things like copywriting, that job is looking like it's potentially going to go. And I think most jobs at creative agencies that aren't physically made by someone is probably going to go in the next 10 years. But what do you guys think? <laughs> Have you guys played with AI yet? Has, has, has anyone here tried AI? Well, there we we've, hands? we've got a couple of... Oh, there how, we, are. we have lots, actually loads, uh, yeah. Okay, so how hard is it to get exactly what you want from AI as a show of hands? It's really, really hard. So I feel like now you still need the person that knows how to use AI properly to actually get what you want from it. So I think at this point, we're still very much in the infant stage of that technology. Therefore, no one's got to worry about anything until at least five years no. until we really get it down. Um, I think Photoshop's implementation has been really, really heavily sort of focused on because they're pushing the marketing on it like crazy. Um, but to be honest, I've played around with it. I think there's still some really good things you can do with it, but it still looks quite fake. It still looks quite, you know, animated, so to speak. So until they really iron that out, I really don't think it's going to replace anyone just yet. So, yeah. Uh, if I could interject there, Josh, on that point, when uh, do you have like a time frame in your head where you think that might actually happen? Do you think it will actually happen? You said it's not there yet, but um, I'm sure everyone would be interested to know, like from someone who is, like you said, it's not quite there yet. Do you think it'll come a point where it will be there? Or I think you're always going to need someone that knows how to use it. I like that answer. I like that yeah. answer. Any any other takers on? Yeah, it's slightly different. Look, I'm completely dyslexic, so I really struggle with a lot of my written work, blog posts, workshop posts, anything like that. So I've been using like ChatGPT to create content probably for the last sort of six months now, and daily I use it. It's an absolute godsend for me. What would normally take me about two months to be writing as a post. I can have done in 30 minutes and the frameworks there you've got to have the initial ideas to be working from but if you um once you start inputting those ideas you've got something to start working with again and then you can then re-insert so exactly as you said there you got to have somebody knows what they're doing to be putting the content in there uh, i've used my wife quite a lot to get her to be able to proof my work before i send it out there because my spelling is so bad it's and my use of grammar is really bad as well but it's allowed me to get content out a hell of a lot quicker as well. Uh, on the image side of things, um, you remember we've been using Content Aware Fill, we've been using Spot Healing, which is exactly that. It's just a, it's a smaller, lesser version of, of AI, and it's been in Photoshop for quite a while, and most of us will use that a hell of a lot as well. So it's, uh, yeah, I'm all up for it. People need to embrace change. I think at the end of the day, it's uh, yeah, and I think it's way too early to be saying what's yeah. going to be what's going to yeah. be happening in the future as well because it's so so early days. So it's interesting to hear you say that this tool um, is enabling for you essentially uh, in a really positive way, which is which is yeah yeah. Great. I wish this was around years ago. Wow. Okay. Yeah. That, that, I mean, that that's a spin. I think maybe some of us may not have actually considered the enabling aspect of AI. Uh, going back to what Josh said as well. Um, you know, having to have that personal input and you've showcased that as well, that it, it still needs to have the inference. So I think, I think that's a really good, I mean, you don't hear many positive things about AI really um, moving forward. So I think well, that is... Yeah, I mean, there's tools like Grammarly and things like that, which can help with spelling and bits and bobs like that, but it doesn't help you with the use of words. Uh, you've got an idea in your head and you want to get it out there. And, and part of being dyslexic is trying to articulate what's up here and get it onto paper. And that's where I really struggle with. And don't get me wrong, it's not a case of I just input a write me a blog on this and then I just copy and paste that and stick that on my blog and use that as my own because I don't because yeah. it's it's yeah. not at that level where it, it can do that. But there's elements I can take from that and then re-put that back into my own words. And it writes in American as well. So <laughs> we're, 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 we're based in the UK. So it's, it's a bit of a giveaway as well. So you do need to work out these little things as well. So well, That's a really great perspective. James, you seem to, you seem to have a, a take that you wanted to share on AI. I think it's a really interesting time to be a creative. It's also quite scary. Like, yeah. like, like you said, like we are looking at jobs disappearing at some points, like copyright and et cetera. Yeah. Um, 
obviously it is incredibly enabling for so many different people as well but you know there is a degree of concern and i'm kind of watching things unfill like at such a quick speed as well like you've got to think what like a couple of years ago ai wasn't really on anyone's radar as something that was practical and now you know we're looking at version six sevens eights like yeah, yeah. different softwares coming very quickly um so yeah i, I don't know like from a like a, a commercial point of view, things will change and probably change quite rapidly, especially how like marketing agencies, et cetera, use content and use creative content. Absolutely, yeah. There's a lot of issues potentially with copyright and infringements that aren't going to be ironed out over the next couple of years. Yeah. So yeah. people have to be cautious with uh, with with what they do and how they're using it, how they are using AI to manipulate other people's work as well, because yeah. that's something that happens quite a lot. Um, so yeah, like I'm watching from myself, like a little like concerned, but uh, I also think there's going to be a bit of a resurgence of sort of the the organic creative work. People are going to be looking for that, and that's going to become a marketable term as well. So I can see, uh, I can see yeah, yeah. Bart nodding there. If you yeah, I think I've so Sal and I were actually discussing this over lunch, and we've got a slightly different take on it because. AI has actually, Dibs mentioned this, it's actually been around for a lot longer than than we think. It's just currently now this marketing boom. Um, but like, yeah, content aware, Phil, spot healing, um, things like this have, have, have been around for years. Yeah, voice isolation, you know. So you used to have voice isolation in Final Cut, Premiere, whatever. Yeah. But now they just stick two letters in front of it and all of a sudden everyone's like, oh, magic. So it, I think a lot of it is is marketing. Obviously, there is. I think there is going to be a shift. There's going to be a progression. Um, I th for me personally, I think a lot of stock photography is going to go down the down the route of AI generated um, images. So I think stock photographers maybe have a little bit um, of thinking to do as to how to pivot. But ultimately, I mean, you can't stop the progress, and so you're either going to be swimming against the the stream and and fighting your way, sort of, or you just ride the wave. Um, and it's, I mean, same with Uber and taxis is a good example, you know, yeah, yeah, taxi yeah. drivers were striking, they, they didn't want it, but ultimately I don't think you can stop the progress. So it's an yeah. interesting comparative taxi drivers, AI photography, uh, who thought we would have got there, but on that subject of different jobs and different people here, um, a nice segue into it. And I think something a lot of people might like to know from, uh, everybody on the stage, um, I'm going to pick on, I don't know. No, actually I'll, I'll put it out to you. And maybe something everybody wants to know, but uh, I'd like to know from you guys as well. The progression, so it's a completely separate subject. We move from the dark side to the to the light and the positive. How did you become full time at what you do? Give us your your deep, dirty, dark secrets, and and how the rest of us can all flourish and and maybe push a hobby into a, a full time operation. Um, I'm gonna go, Courtney. Can I can I pick on you? Is that okay? Hello. Oh, it is. The light's turned off. So, an interesting question. For me, going full-time was sort of an accident. I'm very lucky that um, I was able to step into a full-time photography role. I would say anybody that's looking to go into full-time freelance photography, videography, it involves a lot of self-marketing and confidence. If you are confident in your work and what you can produce for clients and brands, then they are going to want to hire you and work with you. So confidence and self-marketing is a huge thing. For me, I started doing YouTube um, as a hobby and I decided at some point to merge it with my passion for photography and then decided to take my YouTube a little more seriously and put a lot of hard work and effort in over the past year and I've been very lucky that it has paid off. And so now I'm able to work with camera companies, video companies, I'm able to teach photography and do what I love to do, which is great. Um, I am trained in photography. I have a degree in photography, but the video is just something that I've been figuring out as I, as I go. And, uh, luckily it's, it's going well. Well, we think you're, you're doing fantastic. So, uh, <laughs> Thank you. That there. But it's an interesting segue. I'm going to pick on Josh. Uh, sorry, Josh, but, uh, I know through conversations we've had, if you want to pass in the microphone, um, 
I feel like I'm never choosing. People yeah, are choosing yeah. for me. <laughs> but uh, I feel like uh, Josh, uh, uh, from my perspective of chats that we've had, you're you're a you're a highly established, really great videographer and photographer. You shoot for a lot of companies uh, across a wide range. But you're also, um, because I've met some of them in the audience here today, quite well sought after on YouTube and socials. So like we've had conversations where uh, I feel, and I hope you don't mind me saying to the audience, that you're, oh, I'm going to say it anyway, so, um, that you're at a junction where almost you're at that decision process where you've got to pick a tree. So how, how like hearing that Courtney did that self-promotion, has that, has that enticed you one way or the other? Or how do you think you'll progress? moving forward to making one or the other full time as in creativity or the profession that you currently do? I mean, ultimately it comes down to the fact that you have to think about, I mean, you on a spot. Yeah, this is really, this is a difficult one to answer. <laughs> do you want me to come back? They're, 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 <laughs> it's basically him putting my life into, okay, so what are you going to do next? Or yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I want to um, know. Your but, wife's probably watching as yeah, well. So. Uh, so, uh, so ultimately, the way that I got into, j just sort of preface it. So I got into full-time videography and photography from um, basically me and the director of a company that I worked for having a massive argument. Um, I decided I didn't like what he had to say. He decided I didn't, I decided I didn't like what he had to say to me, you know, basically it just ended in a disagreement. So now I was like, okay, so what do I do? Do I then carry on working full time for someone else or do I break away and do what I want to do? Which I'm sure a lot of us sitting here have had that sort of same, you know, thought process. Do I carry on being the employed person or do I be the person that's employing people? Um, and that's difficult, you know, to sort of sit by and sort of think about, you know, how you're going to make the next step in your life sort of thing. But I sort of decided, you know what, I can make that jump now. So I think I was like 20 years old when I started the business. So I was quite young. Um, and then luckily I didn't fall flat on my face. <laughs> I don't know how that happened. Um, but yeah, so, and, uh, and then YouTube came after that. So YouTube was something that was a passion project for me. And my corporate work was always something that paid the bills. Um, I love what I do, don't get me wrong, but if someone said to me, what do you love the most about your job? I'd say it's the, uh, socializing. I love socializing with people, I'm a very social person. And I feel like the thing that actually helps the most with starting a business, if you did want to go freelance, is being a likable person. Because ultimately, no one wants to work with someone they don't like. So you can be the best photographer in the world, the best photographer in the world, but if you're an, if you're an arsehole, no one wants to work with you, right? So I've always sort of found pride in just being a nice person, being yeah. approachable and all that sort of stuff. Unless we ask your old boss. Unless you ask your <laughs> old boss. Um, but the whole thing about going full-time YouTube, um, yeah. YouTube's my passion project and I feel like you need to have a passion project in life to you know, be fulfilled in a creative you know, industry. Um, but I think ultimately corporate stuff that I do is still what, pays the bills ultimately yeah. so yeah interesting very yeah. interesting yeah. okay uh, your colleague next to you lewis these two are thick as thieves yeah. right uh, to be fair i'm the same stance as josh uh i, I went to uh, university and studied film uh, as in cinematography i then worked at an agency uh, running the video department of eight people and the turnover at the agency was crazy we was doing one or two shoots a week with models, locations, and I had to be the accountant all the way from the cinematographer and director. And I realized, why am I doing this for someone else? Why not do it for myself? I'm literally doing what I'd do anyway. And uh, we've got the same thing of like, the corporate videos do pay the bills. And my passion is in short film and music videos. But I mean, even a music video for Jesse J didn't pay that much. So you work with the biggest artists, but you'll get paid more for doing a corporate interview. So it's not always about like who you're working for. It's about what the actual job is itself because you need to think about time. How long are you actually going to be on this? And then look at the actual figure that you're going to be taking at the end. So yeah, pretty same as you. That's really good. I mean, it, it leads me, uh, if you pass the mic to Bart, because um, I mean, we've spoke about this extensively. Uh, it makes me wonder a question that some people might want to be answered as well. Do you feel there's an element of opportunity in there as well, being in the right place at the right time? Uh, you guys with uh, the creativity, I'll try not to steal too much of your funder, I promise. Um, but it, it, obviously you'll, you'll go on to say about that. But what I know as well as prior to that, you were doing uh, Trio Stories also cover a lot of corporate sporting events as well. They work really, really hard, literally out at a boat, doing both stills and videography as well. Um, and uh, obviously now pushing forward with brands. So, um, yeah, I, I just wanted to kind of go back to how we started because actually quite different, I think, than a few of the guys that have prefaced this. So, yeah, I'll let Sal take it because, you know, the story. Okay, yeah, I, I know it as well. Um, yeah, so 
What happened? <laughs> we went to uni. <laughs> we did go to uni in very traditional subjects. Uh, I was studying biology and Bart was studying law. Um, we quickly realized that that sort of life was not for us and uh, we started up our own business at university. This actually gave us the opportunity to start learning photography and filmmaking because we were doing a lot of product photography and things like this, but it gave us the time, most importantly, to explore yeah, filmmaking. It wasn't a photography business. It wasn't a photography business. Uh, it, was a, it was a jewelry business, separate thing. Uh, but yeah, this gave us the opportunity uh, to start shooting. And we started traveling whilst we were at university gopro making like little short travel films on youtube um, and that's where the passion grew um we started more serious work um, for clients bart actually quit university early and found us some amazing jobs with clients for, through um kickstarter actually yeah. which is uh, is a really cool opportunity for anyone looking for for unique jobs actually and this is when we realized that this is what we wanted to do and the way that we took it more like full full time was actually during the pandemic we made a short film on our phone we entered a mobile film festival and we were a finalist and this gave us access to so many contacts in the industry because some of the pri the prizes had to uh, the brands that provided the prizes had to contact us directly and immediately then we've got an in with someone um, it was a huge opportunity for networking um, and that is what really took off um, our business. Yeah, and I think as well, there's a lesson, well, uh, there's a consideration there to make. I think a lot of people's paths are going to be different. And, and to be honest, a lot depends on your um, to like risk tolerance. Because if you're risking your livelihood, if you're risking your mortgage or, you know, basically f five grand, 50 grand or whatever, it's, it's, it's a different value to different people. Like. I decided to quit uni after like four years of studying law, obviously like hundred thousand pounds in debt. So it was a big risk, but at the same time that gave me enormous motivation because the day after I was on the phone for probably three, four hours yeah. calling people up saying, can I t do photos for you? Can I do photos for you? And then like that motivation can really kickstart your career. So if you've got a big risk tolerance, I'm not saying to everyone like, I'll oh, just drop everything and, and go for it. Yeah. Um, but if you've got a big, big risk tolerance, with that comes also like massive motivation in a way. So yeah. yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to add there as well that we started our filmmaking alongside having another business that was that was bringing in the income. So okay. even though you did quit university and that was a bit of a risk, um, generally we were quite comfortable there. And I think that's also how a lot of people start. They'll start as a hobby where yeah. they've got uh, a separate job actually paying the bills and then they'll slowly grow into a full-time position. That's really it's it's, uh, it's an interesting dynamic to the original question of starting out how you, how you guys like balance that. Um, I'm gonna pick on Emily if I may, um, because from uh, outside perspective, like you seem to balance the two worlds quite perfectly. Because um, obviously you started with your photography videography business, um, but you're also um, all over um, socials, for instance. So. Um, yeah, is there an insight to be had there? Like, how is there another Emily? Is there a twin in the audience somewhere that we don't know about? And uh... yeah, there's two of me. That's how I get everything <laughs> done. Uh, so being full time as a wedding photographer and videographer, I was about ten years in, and because it is so seasonal, I started my YouTube channel in the winter to try and create a little bit of additional revenue when I had a bit of time. Okay. And then over time, that has sort of snowballed to take over the weddings, yeah. to which now I would say I'm a full-time YouTuber that has a bit of client work. Yeah. And yeah. it's worked out really well, touching wood. No, with, you... uh, some YouTube sponsorships on the way, it's been really good. As, as, some, as someone with a full-time position who would love to um, you know, have an audience or be in a similar position, and I'm sure there's lots of us out there, um, I, I just find that your ability to balance that you're either like an organizing guru or there is a twin. Um, but yeah, no, it's, that's really fascinating to find out. Um, on the flip side of this, if, if I could pick on James, uh, obviously you were a, originally a professional photographer, but you've been doing a lot of video lately as well. I think that's fair to, but you, um, you've been quite vocal, at least with us in, in, in that your more word of mouth website rather than socials. So in terms of getting into how you got into it and not using like the social side of things, is there an, an aspect or an element there that you think would help people trying to get to your position? 
Oh man, great question. I don't know. It's it's funny. Like I, I did use social media a lot more than I now do. Yeah. I feel like I've taken a real step back from it because it's not been, it's not been giving me what I want to give. It's yeah. taken up too much of my time, for instance. Right. Okay. And, uh, time is just it's something that you don't get back. No, so, no, no. Uh, I had to pick and choose. It's like, well, do I focus more on that? Do I put more time into that and make that grow into what I want? Or do I find a way to make something else work? So yeah. you know, I still use social media. I, I think I'm just human. Um, humans use social media. So now. if I can keep you on that topic, um, another topic I'd love to discuss with you guys, and I think it's one that, I mean, we're at the Wales and West Photography Show today, um, but we're seeing a lot of video. And obviously the market, uh, everyone can identify as moving more into a hybrid term. Um, so you started as a photographer primarily, You've been doing a lot of high-class video lately as well with stills too. How do you feel or how do you feel about the market? Or, or do you agree? Do you think the market or this industry is moving more towards um, a hybrid way of moving forwards? Like how does that fit in with you, uh, for instance? It's a good question. I, like I feel as creatives, you are squeezed for more and more from your clients. Now. Right, okay, okay. People want more and people expect more. Uh, I, I don't think I'm alone in saying that, is that fair to say? It um, and it, part, part of the challenge is to try and manage expectations so you can know that you're always going to deliver yeah. what your client wants. So if a client wants video and photography, you go, well, how much of that can I deliver yeah. as an individual within your time frame? And yeah. Obviously, if it's feasible, then great. If not, then that's a conversation that you then have to have as well. So Courtney, um, I think that you, you, you manage that quite well as well because like your YouTube is very, it's, um, it's fascinating. You've taken uh, what I would consider was the attractive side of photography on TV and you've managed to captivate it into your YouTube channel to make it um, not only uh, like how to and tutorial, uh, but also fascinating to watch your process and everything. But uh, it's quite evident from watching your, your videos that you, that it is about photography but it's a video so um yeah how, yeah how do you um, that? so video has been uh, a way of me getting very good exposure for my photography uh so yeah i have a lot of fun with the video and i think it's incredibly useful i think it's really great that people who have never done video before can now pick up a camera and take photos and also experiment with video and i think we are definitely in a period where video is one of the most popular forms of content across the internet you'll find that you know instead of just reading the news or a newspaper now everything's in video content in video form um the younger generations are growing up with video pretty much you know TikTok, all of these apps and i i, I think it's great i think it's a great way to put across information to learn new things in terms of my landscape photography it's a great a great way for me to teach photography in a way that is easily accessible to those who want to learn about photography without having to pay for a course necessarily if they can't afford to or are not able to um yeah i think it's yeah it's a great in way to allow other people in to my insight of how i work and how i create my art that's really wonderful um i'm gonna move to dibs next uh, because James, you mentioned uh, managing expectations and we not so long ago had a, a discussion about how um, you were being pulled into work because you were good at it, that you didn't particularly want to do and you were finding those expectations not so much challenging but more pushing towards an area you didn't want to. So Yeah, it was, um, it was a tricky one for me because I was just finishing my uh, master's degree in 2018 yeah. and I was having to create a lot of commercial work. I did a, a commercial photography degree uh, and just picking up on the video side of thing. Oh, I just died. There we are. I think we've got a handy. Uh... Yeah, and the uh, the video, the, sorry, the photography degree I did was um, just starting to get geared up towards video as well. Yeah. Uh, but it was a, a big commercial basis on what 
I was sort of working on. So that's kind of led me into that. Um, unfortunately, I live in the east of England, so it's a bit of a chore to get anywhere from there. So <laughs> I was I was having to go to London to go to, to pick up some nicer jobs uh, or Nottingham. I was doing a lot of events photography and stuff like that as well, which I really enjoy, don't, don't get me wrong. But having a child as well, uh, I was missing out on a lot of important time with her. And there was a lot of travel time as well. So on top of a six, seven, eight hour shoot, there was also four hours of travel. Travel, and then there was yeah. backup time for video, well, for photography, for images. Yeah. I don't really do a lot of video work myself, so it was getting pretty hard. And I reached burnout. I hold my hands up. I absolutely burnt myself completely out. And uh, 2018 end of that was not a really good time for me, to be honest. And uh, it was lucky I had some good friends around me as well. That gave me the well having. My, my friends, my wife, uh, counselor as well at the time as well, around me, it allowed me to have the confidence to take a step back from what I was doing. And I took a side step in my career. I, I was working as a photographer there and then, running a lot of workshops and other bits and pieces. And I decided to um, sort of take a, quite a side step and I, w I went and took a PAYE job. And I've not looked back at that since. Yeah. Uh, but I get to test video in uh, photo editing software every single day of the week. Yeah. So whatever I shoot during the weekend, I get to take that and uh, I test that on video and uh, photo editing products and help develop our own products in-house as well. And then I do my own work. Everything I shoot now for me is from the heart. And that's what my sort of plan has been covid came along and put a bit of a stopper on that as well yeah i had to ask myself the questions what's what is my photography bringing to the world do i need to be out there taking photos while covid is rampant and the answer to, the, to myself was no so i made a decision not to i thought i'm going to put my plans on hold just stick at the job i've got an income coming in i've got my health i've got my family yeah. they were important things to me and since covid sort of has dwindled away i've made up Put, started making that push again now not with video it's something i don't really i don't i, I get on with i started you the whole youtube thing as most photographers do we started getting there quite up. well with it yeah. and uh was really really enjoying it and um, but i started to find the video aspect was taking away from the photography element as well yeah. so i decided to i want to focus on m my image making as an asset really and just to en enjoy that for what it is Okay, well, that's uh, thank you for your answer. I think it's uh, yeah. really encompassing. Um, I'm a, a gilded cinematographer, and I was recently asked by my guild to write an article on uh, mental health within television professionals. Um, so it's interesting to uh, it's a segue into a question I would like to I think I put out to Lewis um, because you're quite frivolent these days. You are up, down, left, right, all over the country. Um, yeah. And as someone who's younger coming into the industry, uh, and I'd certainly love to hear what everyone else has, the term burnout, um, some people might see when you're not so full-time as an actual issue, but it is a very real uh, and, and affecting thing. It's something I've covered in my article. As someone um, who is as busy up and down the country traveling, like you said, putting in those hours, is that something you worry about or do you have a coping mechanism for uh, creative burnout? It's normally when my girlfriend gets mad at me that I know <laughs> that I've got way too much. But it's, uh, it's, it's a really hard battle, you know. Like I use Google Calendar to plan everything out, but we've got uh, really good marketing at the moment with our Google SEO. So we're getting loads of jobs coming in all the time. But it then means how do you budget time for these jobs? If one job goes over, it can have a catastrophic effect three weeks down the line. Next week, uh, we've got a music video and then like two days after we're in Paris for an Iran peace summit. And then we're back in Wales and then we're back up north. And it's the amount of traveling, like my car, about 20,000 miles put on that this yeah, year. Yeah. And I think it's working out how much you can take. And we figured out no more than four jobs a month. Wow, okay. So you actually have it's a process four, system in place. Yeah, no more than four two day shoots wow. because it's the, the pre-production and post-production on top of that. If we have a large production that's like four or five days, that will have to be like a standalone production that takes two weeks of the time because I've currently got one part-time editor and one part-time producer. Yeah. So I also need to make sure I'm not overworking them. Uh, it's, it's just hard to figure it all out. I mean, I'm, I'm still learning at the time, but I mean, how do you kind of do it? <laughs> <laughs> he, he's actually really good at scheduling himself. Right, you seem okay. to be pretty on top of your stuff. I think he's just smiling to be a nice he's guy. Smiling. Is that? Uh, so, 
I've been doing, so I've been full time since 2018. So we're coming up to, well, if my math is correct, about five, five years. Yeah. Six years will be next year, of course, because that's after five. Um, so, that was a dumb thing to say. Massive shots. <laughs> <Maths. laughs> um, and the first sort of two or three years, of course, you spend all your time trying to make it as big and good as you can. You sort of think, oh, I want to run an agency. I want to have people working for me. But I sort of realized early on that the thing that I valued more than anything was time. So having time to myself, time to my, you know, to spend with my family and stuff. And there's actually a quote that someone told me, which was, um, if you were to die tomorrow, your workplace would replace you within a week, but your family would never forget you. And it sort of really stuck with me. It, it, it makes me realize actually priorities in life should be about the people, not yeah. about the work itself. So Absolutely. as long as I've got enough time to go out and have a dinner with my family and do that, then I think that your scheduling's fine. So yeah. Brill, um, yeah, over to Bart. Yeah, I was just going to say, when we started out, um, was the time when hustle culture was like quite the, the yeah. thing to do. So like hustle culture was like super sexy. Like, you know, posting on Instagram, like, oh, I've done three all-nighters in a row. And, and, and we actually got marketed. Like I was thinking, the more we can do in a short period of time, the more we can travel, the more projects we can take on, the more, the better we'll be, you know? And, and I think that was like, I don't know, super dangerous for us. So just for everyone out there who might not be aware, hustle culture. Yeah, yeah. Um, you want me to define it? Yeah, go for it, shoot. Um, yeah, we did, we did do a podcast. Well, do you remember what it is? I don't, I don't know. Hustle culture. Yeah, just define it, I don't know. Do you, do you want me to define take over? culture it's um so, priority it's basically prioritizing work over everything else it's like first and foremost that's your priority that's pretty much saying going it. for it from when you wake up to when you go to sleep you are yeah. on non-stop at work because that's all that matters uh you have an outcome at the end and it is you are going to get there irrespective of family financial everything else is that fair definition yeah. of hustle yeah. and so it's about owning that and being proud of it uh, and obviously you can uh kind of guess and understand the, the the effect that comes from living a life in such a fast manner um is that a fair yeah yeah i was just gonna say so for like 2019 um it was actually a period of time where we were doing so many jobs uh, all around the world that there was no there was only one time we spent in our apartment for longer than two weeks so we were all over the place and that was really crazy after that obviously the pandemic hit and that just took us out completely and all of a sudden we were burnt out and had to completely rethink our working systems and behaviors and learning to say no is a huge part of that when yes. you're especially as you're growing as a creator because when when you're at kind of the beginning and middle steps every job that comes in can be the biggest job that you've ever done yeah so yeah. how can you say no to that uh, when it's how, how do you say no? For people who out there might be on the cusp of uh, talking to a brand, uh, looking for a next job, maybe moving on to something, and you're right, like that exposure or that job could be the one that makes you or pushes you into that full time or puts you as an artist uh, and an expert in the field. How do you say no? How do we say no? Yeah. So the email goes something like, Dear Sir Madam, <laughs> thank you so much for reaching out. Unfortunately, we won't be able to collaborate at this Why? time. What, what, oh, no, how do you prioritize that job that you're saying no to? Oh, how? D okay, yeah, that's so tougher. That, maybe I should have been a more specific. No, so I think. I th <laughs> <laughs> this, uh, madam, no. No, I think I think we. So, and again, this is very different at different stages of your career. So, yeah. we prioritize now a lot of the time um, a company, not necessarily by by budget or by um, you know the opportunities or whatever that we think it might provide but a lot of it is actually about like whether we share the same values whether yeah. we morally want to work with that company or, okay. or you know whether it's people that we're going to click with yeah um yeah i've got also a good point to that and it, it also takes a lot of self-awareness to realize when you need to say no because those points are really crucial um we were offered on the biggest project the biggest film project we've ever had and we started working on it for a couple of weeks yeah. and i decided that i wasn't at that place and time that i could take on that size of a project um and had to say no and That's instead really it, yeah it was huge it was the first time we've ever said no and we've been doing this for like six years 
Um, so that was a really big deal for us. But now it's given us the confidence that the world didn't end when we said no. Our careers didn't end. Um, there we are, guys. So it is okay to say no. So, yeah, you can say no and prioritize your own health. Dibs, um, I'm going to pick on you again. Uh, Dibs, uh, back to our conversation. You really owned the yeah, I, mean, I know I, who I am. I said no. It was really hard. I couldn't say no. I was, uh, I was self-employed in an area where... Everybody who owns a camera seems to work as a photographer, yeah. which, which was really, really hard. It seemed to be a bit of a race to the bottom as well for pricing and stuff like that as well. That's it. Um, That's it yeah. But it was what what made it easier for me was I started to look into what jobs I actually wanted to do. And yeah. I was really honest with myself. Sometimes I'd take a lesser paid job because I knew it was going to be good fun to work on. There was going to be more creativity involved in it as well. Yeah. And now I, I still get tags in posts, people looking for a photographer for this or that. And most of them, I just say I'm just too busy to yeah. take on. Uh, but the ones I really like the look of, I do get in contact with because it's actually something that I would like to be part of. Yeah. And, and I think that's, that's what's important to me now is something that can be fun like that. I think you do that really well. I think that you own who Dibs McAllen is. And I think, like Sal, you said that becoming self-aware. I think that's a big part of this step into full-time who you are and, and what you're about. I think that I think it's something that everyone here does really, really well as well. So um, it's come up a couple of times and obviously we're coming out of it and, and it's, it's almost getting to a mute point discussing it. But the pandemic has come up a couple of times with this. So uh, Emily, with um, being someone who primarily relied on originally wedding videography and that I imagine that had a vast impact on you going back to the mental health of being in this industry and uh, the pandemic how did that affect you and how do you think things are moving on from those restrictions uh, and the industry moving forward from that that period of time was honestly a nightmare things got rescheduled yeah. years and years in advance so I think I only did my final rescheduled covid wedding maybe six months ago it, wow it, it, it really had an impact yeah. And when you consider that I may have been paid for that in 2019, yeah. you did, I did feel like I was working for free for half the time. <laughs> yeah. uh, but what I did was I pivoted and very quickly and I created a lot of online courses, yeah. some for myself and some for another company, uh, where it was wedding photography, Lightroom courses, things like that. Okay, um, really cool. And it was a lot of editing at my desk, and uh, but it was ideal for that era because yeah. we needed something yeah. to keep us afloat. Um, but I think having the core skills is very important because you can pivot and change a little bit if you do need to. Hopefully it doesn't happen again. Well, we, I think, I think we, all, we can all agree to that. But no, that, that's, that's really fascinating to find out. Are those courses still available? Can people Yes, still... indeed. They're on my website, microphonenerds.com. Oh, there we are. <laughs> Shameless plug. Fantastic. Um, Courtney, you, you do a lot of exploring in uh, the woods with, on your videos and, and with your photography. Um, I don't know if we can reach that far. Maybe an up and over job. Um, uh, Hello. Hey. There we are. We've got it back. So staying on the subject of the pandemic, if I may, uh, we'll, we'll go over to James as well. Um, how did that affect you and how is coming out of that now? Uh, at, at, has it had a residual effect? Does it change the way you go about things now? Um, so when the pandemic hit, I was living abroad in South Korea. I was actually an okay. English teacher and I was not doing photography. Wow. Photography was a hobby for me. And so I was living out there and all of a sudden the country pretty much shut down and I lived in the most rural province you could find in South Korea. And so I was locked down in a tiny rural village and able to go anywhere. And that sort of forced me to figure out what was important in my life as it did for a lot of people. In the end, I had to leave my job, my teaching job. I wasn't able to stay there. So I came back to the UK and I was unemployed. I did continue to teach freelance for a while, but I realized that I wanted to pursue my passion of photography and continue making videos. So I used the pandemic as uh, a step to go and do that and see if it worked um, otherwise I think the pandemic being locked down for such a long time I was locked down in South Korea then I came to the UK and we were locked down in the UK for quite a while I think it was probably I came in back to the UK in August 2020 and it wasn't until sort of June 21 I believe that we were allowed to sort of really go out and about yeah and I missed being out. I missed being out in the forest. I missed exploring. I missed all of the 
British landscapes that I hadn't seen in four years while I was living in South Korea. So that really motivated me to really get out as much as possible to go and pursue photography and, and videography as well. So now I just spend as much time outdoors in nature as, as possible. I think, uh, I mean, I mean that it's really great to hear and, um, that, you know, it's opened that light and, and that's how it's turned into a positive. I know. Uh, yeah, no, I just wanted to jump in because actually like this whole conversation, every topic is kind of tying in really nicely to show the importance of being able to pivot as a creator. Yeah. yeah. So AI, video. I kind of did a theme there. Uh, uh, yeah. And COVID. <laughs> so every, every time we've, we've had to like, to some extent, reinvent ourselves yes. uh, uh, in the creative field. And I think that is yeah that is just super super important i mean for us during the pandemic we um we like lost the vast majority of our clients because they were travel related things yeah so all of a sudden we became more like editors we were working a lot with like stock footage and and making things happen for companies with like minimal footage maybe that we'd shot before yeah and using 80 percent stock footage so that was really strange um then we decided to also start a youtube channel so it, that was sort of pivoting um so yeah so, yeah i wanted to just say here as well um it's about jumping on those opportunities uh so our first film that won the short film festival well it was a finalist in the short film festival was a comedy about how to survive a pandemic yeah it was great it was really great Thank you. <laughs> um and so yeah we took advantage of that opportunity with ai now um we just had a viral video that was based on on ai i don't think james has seen that one but I don't um, think anyone who's it. a nikon user please don't watch it and uh, please don't hate us we're really sorry nikon as well they're sorry. up there <laughs> yeah so it, it was quite funny uh the video in question i'll save sal having to have potatoes thrown at her and we apologize to the audience in advance but the uh, AI actually turned uh, Nikon into it was oh it was a turning his Canon into a potato um, when she asked it to be a decent camera or Nikon. A Nikon, yeah. yeah. So yeah, that actually went viral. Uh, I think it's an AI topic thing. So these views um, are not ours. We'll be selling rotten tomatoes at the back towards the end, so you can actually take that out on them. Um, I just really wanted to hone in that point of like taking advantage of these big opportunities and, and yeah. times like AI now is a huge thing that people should jump on shorts as well like with YouTube shorts uh, short content TikTok you can hate it but it's happening so in some way or another whether you take it as a parody or yeah. take it seriously um, they're great opportunities to grow as a creator so I'd like to go back to Lewis on that because um, it's, it's an interesting topic uh, short form versus long form topics that we're saying on the video um, <laughs> yeah so this is actually killing me because my opinion has been changed recently oh wow okay uh, let's let's hear how I, and why I had to manage like large commercials where we'd also be aiming to get verticals and then in the pitch meeting we'd be going over the the widescreen master advert and then it seemed that everyone cared more about the verticals anyway and then going out there freelancing every single time the client asks for delivery they want verticals as well so we can obviously make some more money there but yeah now i just got an s52x that i basically <laughs> mount vertically and that does all uh, basis does all the stuff i need um uh, yeah do you want to tell us why josh do you want to like Is it, so, so interestingly um with a lot of camera and camera systems uh, aspect ratio is also come into because we're seeing hybrid models for still photography but um, as you're saying, like uh, a lot of socials, Instagram used to be the go-to for photographers. I think that's fair to say. And now it's like shifting between video and everything else. But the format has remained the same in that we're now uh, portrait instead of landscape. And that be it for uh, shorts, long form, uh, video and photography content. Um, Josh is, uh, is a Lumix ambassador. You, uh, is that fair to say? You're definitely a Lumix shooter. And so companies like Lumix are putting in aspect ratios within their camera systems to enable you to do both at the same time. So what you were touching on there with like treatments with uh, brands and clients in wanting both content shots at the same time. It's the open gate, it's like 6K yeah. square. So it's brilliant. So if we're aiming to get the widescreen advert, we don't have to do another take for the vertical, which saves time in production, saves time in post-production. And it's just a lot easier. And like, I think every other camera company should be jumping on this bandwagon. Yeah. Because for every single person here, I'm pretty sure we can all, yeah, it's so useful. And like, that's pretty much why I bought the Lumix, like straight up. 
Cool, that's, re that's, re that's really good to hear. On um, the subject of, because we, we are here for Format High Tech, we are a filter company, the world's best filter company. Um, in your work, so we're talking about using different technologies, different aspects. Um, I'd just like to go from top to bottom, or bottom to top, uh, left to right. Um, in terms of filtration, what you use, why, if you use it, if you don't use it, starting with uh, young man Josh. Um, so if you do any video, you need an ND filter. That's always a given. That's uh, number one. Um, and then the other filter that I'm using quite a lot, actually. So um, if you shoot a lot of video, you'll realize that the DSLR or mirrorless cameras are somewhat slightly over sharpened. So they look a little bit more digital than, let's say, a cinema camera. Um, so sort of softening up your image and making it look a bit more cinematic, if you like. Uh, diffusion filters are the best thing to do that. Um, so I shoot on the Lumix S5 II, the S52X, and the only way that I can find to get it to look somewhat close to that sort of organic filmy look is to use a diffusion filter. So I use the silver quarter strength diffusion from Format High Tech. Oh. <laughs> That's pretty much the only filter I have Shameless at the front spot. of my camera, and then just a neutral density filter as well. Um, of course, if you use a, uh, a variable ND, then you can get sometimes the crossing. If you guys have ever used that, it, sort of, it creates this horrible vignetting look sort of thing. Um, so I've actually started to use just a solid NDs from format as well. Um, normally you can get away with point, point 0.9 to 1.2 and then you're pretty much set. So those are the filters I use since we're talking about filters. No, 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 that's good. That's good. Um, so that's from a video aspect, which is really cool to hear. Um, so like James, recently we, um, it's on our YouTube channel as well. So if you want to go and head over and check that out, it's really great. We did a podcast with two and um, we went up into the, the forest of the valleys um, it was quite comical because it was a beautiful day. We don't often get those in the valleys. If you come from the valleys, you'll know full well it's mainly grey and wet. Um, but we had a lovely sunny day, and James decided to take us into a freezing cold wood instead. Um, and whilst we were there... I and loved it. Yeah, I, I did. I loved shivering. Um, whilst we were there, um, something that we're noticing as a company in trends, I'm not sure uh, if anyone in the audience would agree, but you uh, actually honed this. Um, we're seeing diffusion being used, as Josh said, in photography as well. And you actually did that on this shoot. Um, and you gave some very, uh, again, the, the, we've got a podcast up on our YouTube channel. Um, and also we, we did a short with James as well, so you can hear a bit more in depth about this particular video. Um, but there was a very specific reason why you chose to use diffusion. Would you care to share that with our audience today? Yeah, of course. Um, it was a very particular circumstance that these guys were going to take me to a beautiful vista, uh, which we did eventually get to. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> we were log walking along the, the side of the Marty Woods and uh, the light was just coming through the trees. Uh, it was absolutely stunning. So I was like, sorry guys, we're going to go in here. <laughs> David got a wet foot, uh, you hung back sensibly. Yeah, I did, uh, yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'd, I'd actually left uh, the diffusion filters in the car thinking, oh, I, I I'm probably not going to use them for what you're thinking about. Um, but I just looked at it and I was like, this is the perfect place to try this. Oh, no. I was like, David had uh, one on his camera that he was using the video. And I was like, can, can I borrow that, mate? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so I pinched it and uh, it, it was just wow. Um, absolutely stunning. For what, shooting um, what, what made you make that decision about that scene with photography particularly? Because just the point that Josh raised with videography is uh, nowadays uh, glass is very sharp, sensors are very sharp. You know, we, we've got cameras capable of 12K uh, on our stall over there. We've got 6K, 8K visible cameras. And, and so the, the resolution is fantastic. Uh, the glass that's being shot on is very sharp as well. And so taking off that digital image to um, add another aspect to your video, um, going back to photography specifically, what made you within that remit? Because it's, it used to be quite unusual, but as I said, we're seeing a trend in it. What made you make that decision to use diffusion uh, for the scene that you were taking? I'm sure most photographers would agree that it's actually quite a challenge to shoot directly into the sun. Um, you deal with a lot of uh, various... Uh, aberrations from your lens, um, lens flares. Um, video guys love it, of course. Uh, it serves a really good narrative purpose and can uh, really help sell the story that you're trying to sell. But photography, particularly landscape photography, less so. People want to feel like they are actually looking at the scene rather than looking for yeah. something looking at the scene. It, yeah. takes you, it breaks the willful suspension of disbelief. Yep. Um, but using something like the diffusion filter for that, 
um, it really softened the effects of the lens flares, the aberrations, and uh, it turned it into something that was much more manageable. Yeah. And uh, the effect that the sort of um, the, the soft, the halo and effect that it had on the, on the sun as well, coming through the trees in that scene, it was just beautiful. It was almost like how it should have looked. Like yeah. A, a yeah. hazy forest sort of thing, sunlight beam, and it was, it was it's a shame perfect we did, tool for it. We didn't have it to put up here, but you can actually go over to James's socials and, and that, that shot is up there. It's, it's, it's beautiful, to be uh, quite frank. Um, we're running short of time, unfortunately, as much as I could sit here and ramble all day. Um, do we have any questions from the audience? Anybody who would like to ask any particular person? No? Yeah, I'll get you a, I'll get you a microphone, sir. Oh. How do they? Okay, brilliant. Um, does anyone want to pick that up? Did you hear the question? So, a uh, chap there was, um, how, for your videos, do you script? And if so, how? How do you come up with those? Oh, I think we've got... She's like literally the best at pre-production. I don't oh, know okay, if in the world, are. but definitely top 10. So can you run um, us through that process, like conceptualize script? Yeah, so it's a really quite chaotic process because there's so many things involved there. So we've really dialed in our workflow using Notion. Um, it's an app which is incredible for this kind of uh, thing. And we also get to share that directly with clients through a link. Um, which also gives them the comfort that they can trust you uh, with your project because they can see everything laid out there. Um, so firstly, brainstorming, uh, we're, quite, we're quite wild with brainstorming. We're known for taking all of our ideas way too far. Um, yeah. You go. I I'm currently in the middle of booking a military chopper for, for an upcoming project um, <laughs> this month. So uh, yeah, that's just the how how too far we take Subs things. Subscribe so. to see that one? Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, bro. But yeah, so we, we usually run through like about three sort of levels of ideas. Like we'll do our initial ideas. Um, we'll look at a w websites like Shot Deck. I don't know if anyone uses Shot Deck, which is amazing. You can yeah. get stills from, from uh, films. Um, they're broken down into like color palettes, things like that. Um, we also use AI to generate some images uh, to show clients our like ideas and concepts. Yeah, yeah. So we'll like actually generate frames, uh, yeah. and 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 in some in some projects we've managed to get a frame that you know if you put it next to the AI one that we generated, like you can barely tell the difference. We nailed the lighting, the color temperature, everything. So this gives the client the confidence that okay, this is what the shoot's going to look like. Yeah, let's go. They can sign off on it. Yeah. Um, we would obviously go through the deliverables, the, the budgeting, break down the budgets, so travel, props, talent, everything like that. Yeah. Um, and probably do about two or three back and forths with the client as well. So uh, So I think maybe if, if I've got, it's maybe about talking in front of the camera and how you structure that, potentially. Um, uh, Emily, you're fantastic with that as well. Is there like when you're hey. giving your, <laughs> when you're giving your, um, because you're very concise about what you're saying to the point, um, a, a, again, if you haven't checked out anybody here, you, you can pick up all of this on their channels. Um, how do you come to fruition of the whole thing? Like, what's the... Yeah, so when I'm doing sort of a product review, for instance, um, I'll be taking notes on my phone throughout the process for what I want to talk about. And there's two ways of doing it. You can either script it word for word and teleprompt yourself, yeah. or you can do what I do, which is just give yourself talking point bullet points and then just be a little bit more fluid. And I think okay. my style's a little bit more conversational. Yeah. I use a piece of software called Millanote, uh, which syncs on your phone and your iPad and your laptop. And then when I'm out and about, I can take rough notes and then I can flesh it out when I'm at home yeah. and then I just have it on the desk with me and sort of do take a bullet point by bullet point. Well, I mean, I, I use Millinote with commercial clients uh, and shot decks. So I'll take shot decks when I'm trying to do what's called a treatment. So I'm putting forwards what I think this overall package is going to come that I'm selling to a client. Um, and I'll put that together on Millinote. It's like a digital sticky notepads. Um, and it, it helps to visualize, but also, as you said, it's not so structured that you can't be conversational and human with your prospective clients. So maybe, um, hopefully that answered the question a little bit. Um, any, any other questions? Anybody? Oh, that's a spicy one. So 
uh, I would like to pick on Josh. The question was, is there much of a difference these days, a really good question, between a digital uh, stills camera and a cinema camera? Be careful because you know what I love. I'm going to say yes and no. Oh. So, so yes, because when people think cinema, they think uh, dynamic range and they think rolling shutter. That's what I think at least. So ultimately, when you're shooting cinema, you need to have a fast sensor readout in order to not get the wobbliness, you know, when you're sort of panning and stuff. And unfortunately, a lot of, uh, you know, sort of mirrorless and DSLR cameras still have quite a lot of rolling shutter. Um, as much as I love Lumix, it's one thing they struggle with compared to other things they do. Um, they all have resolution, you know, full frame, Super 35. It doesn't really matter anymore. You can still get a good image. Um, but I think that that is ultimately the biggest deciding factor is your rolling shutter and also, um, what was the other point I said? I forgot. What dynamic. And dynamic range. Yeah, of course. So if you look at Red, for example, they quote 16 stops, di uh, stops of dynamic range. Yes. Um, whereas 16 plus. 16 plus. I actually, but, I'm, I'm a Red shooter, if you don't read digital cinema. So. Um, but realistically, when you actually look at the charts, you don't get that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I don't think there's too much of a difference now. If, if, if I had £5,000 to spend on getting a new camera for my work and I could decide between getting a cinema camera or a, a hybrid camera, I think your money would be better spent nowadays on a hybrid camera because then you can spend the rest on lenses and ultimately that's really where it, what it comes down to. I think if you have a camera that can shoot 4K that does at least 10 bit video, that's pretty much okay for most things. Wonderful. So yeah. Really, really, really comprehensive answer. I've just got like a one sentence answer. No you dual 95 ISO, please. No, no. You can, shoot a you can shoot anything on an FX3. And that's it. Like, in, in my opinion, if, if someone comes to me and says, uh, oh, okay, it's a, an, an A7S three, then it's the same camera, but not class, yeah, uh, yeah. cinema camera. Okay, if someone comes to me and says, oh, no, I can't shoot my film on an A7S three, then either your story's weak or, you know, like, obviously there is an upgrade, the, the, but the higher you go, the, the, the gain is less and less. So, uh, in my opinion, like, you can now get a, a regular hybrid camera and shoot an absolute cracking Oscar winning film. Yeah, yeah, yeah I was, I could see Have you it. seen, anyone seen the trailer for The Creator? Like the new film coming out, yeah. Uh, that's just shot on a rigged up FX3. Yeah. And that's a top tier Hollywood film with huge VFX going into it. And it's just showing that prosumer cameras are capable of a lot more than we give them credit for. And as you can even see on Baby Driver, they use anamorphic lenses on an A7 III and the, like the camera is this big and the lens is like this and it just shows that these small full frame like hybrids can do everything so i'm going to play devil's advocate for the people with the thoughts in the head in the crowd and i know you're in a good position to answer this going back to uh what james said and uh dibs approached on client expectation though oh man it's so uh client expectation uh my, myself i recently purchased a cinema camera because of client expectation um I am paid an X amount to arrive on a set to film a piece and the equipment is expected. Now, uh, it's been proven recently that you're absolutely right with any camera here, we can produce something fantastic, which is great because it's enabling for us all um, to take wonderful photographs and uh, video. How do you go about securing a client with an expectation that differs from your actual knowledge base? Okay, I think first of all, you need to have a introductory meeting with the client where okay. I have a deck that I run them through that goes from everywhere from That's how, really useful how we use Milano to how much we're going to charge. If we show up with the Blackmagic cameras, they're going to be a lot more expensive on data. Yeah. So if it's a smaller client, I just show up with a gimbal and a Lumix. Yeah. But on obviously the larger sets, if they want to go a step further, we can rent a Red or an RE. But it, that's that I try and make sure within the first 15 minutes of meeting the client, of being on that introductory call, what do they actually want and what can they afford? And yeah. if you should, if you can't do that in the first 15 minutes, try and make a, a PowerPoint presentation. It doesn't have to be fancy. Just outline absolutely every point that you're going to go through and try and make sure there's no miscommunication. Be really, really clear with your client. Real, real fantastic. Um, does anybody else have, before we close off, does anybody else in the audience have any burning questions you'd like to pick from uh, our, our panel today? Yes, sir, go on. I stole them. <laughs> I, I directed videos at an agency. I built up a relationship with these clients personally. 
And when I left the agency, a lot of them still come to me now because they know that I really took the extra step to make sure the video was good. So uh, you're gonna? Yeah, I was gonna say think outside the box. So a lot of the time, I mean, of course, now it's basically done on word of mouth. So a lot of the time when you have three or four clients and they have friends that work for certain companies, I go, oh, this guy did this video, it was fantastic, or they did this for us. And then I would just ask you directly. So that's a really easy way to get clients. But of course, when you don't have that already, how would you do it? So. Of course, people normally go, oh, this email, let's send a blanket email to, you know, 50 companies and see what happens. Nine times out of 10, you probably get one response. It'll be like, we're not that interested. So what actually the first uh, client that I got in London, um, it was night times were in London and their shop looked fantastic. So I took a photo of it and I printed it and I posted it through their letterbox. And then the next day it had my details on it. They got in touch with me and I said, this is a really nice photo. And we started a conversation because I'd given them something for nothing. So I feel like don't be afraid to work for nothing to start off with, but just don't let them, you know, get too ahead of themselves and ask for too much. That's what I'd say. That's a really fantastic answer. Really good. Just a quick one. I think it's a little bit um, maybe unconventional, well, not unconventional, but in the age of social media, everyone be like, oh, you've got to be active on social media. You've got to have a super beautiful website i think we've come back full circle that actually in-person networking is now the new social media and, and 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 yeah i mean even one thing yeah calling people is better than a cold email give them a call let them hear you sound enthusiastic about their project their their brand um that worked for us that that the very first project we ever got was a phone call um i think the guy could tell that i was just absolutely pumped to to pitch to him and 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 we landed it. Um, yeah, yeah, I think in-person networking, phone call, a voice, a human face just goes a long way. Um, mine is gonna go back to Notion and the way that I did approach to cold, cold email recently was I created just a really um, sick presentation of, of the kind of deliverables I wanted to provide this client. Um, I just straight, went, straight up went in there with the confidence to say, look, I, I want to do this work for you. Um, here are the de deliverables you'd get. Here's these examples of our work, like very specific examples um, that would be relevant to them. And yeah, I just, we included this this PDF and I think within like four days they got back and they loved it. So you could kind of still use the cold email approach, but it's, it's, it's about, you've got to stand out amongst everyone else that is sending those things. So if you can think of any way to, to set yourself apart from everywhere, everyone else, that still can work. Yeah, yeah, I think it's interesting. I don't know how you all feel, but like to answer your question from my perspective um, and to go back to what Josh said, I think it's important to build a good portfolio that really sells you as well uh, and what you can do because um, it's great to connect with these people. I don't know how you guys think about this, but uh, it's great to connect with these people, but to show up without nothing to show. And of course, you it's like the chicken and the egg, isn't it? You've got to get that work to show that work. Um, so it's about not being afraid because although you're not being financially benefited from that, you, you will be, you will get financial benefit from that. Um, the free work that you're providing or services is giving you something to showcase and move forwards. I'm not sure how, or if you guys would agree with having that as well, uh, having a decent portfolio. Um, I've struggled this year to maintain mine, but uh, again, word of mouth is actually uh, fantastically working. So I haven't needed to myself. Um, weddings, um, is that more of a word of mouth or a previous show? Um, because I'm sure there's a lot of people here that might necessarily consider their first step being taking captures of a wedding um, or video? Yeah, so I started off uh, offering my services as an associate shooter or uh, a second shooter for people that were more established in the industry. Yeah. And then what you want long term really is word of mouth. You know, you, you'll make friends with, with people and then it'll be someone's bridesmaid, someone's sister the yeah, year yeah. after. Uh, but starting out, it really is just working for more affordable day rates or even for free if you are trying to learn but then knowing when to stop once you've got what you need yeah have some confidence to start charging what you're worth there's a interesting topic there i think we'll close out on how do you I, I think everyone might like to know how do you know what is a good day right how much to charge um i know the the actual figure is a touchy subject for all of us um because we're probably all competing but um take I've it away got, i've got like a, an idea um not specifically like the day rates but yeah. um how we were kind of figuring out our price points was that every time someone said yes we increased it 
Right. Okay. Wow. Um, okay. Because they said yes far too quickly. Like there should have been some negotiation there. If someone said <laughs> yes to you rapidly and biting your hand off, you know you're not charging enough. Yeah. Um, so yeah, every time someone said yes, we put it up a little bit until we reached a point that we've not yet reached where someone says, oh yeah, once with actually the clothing brand, they we were far too expensive. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> shh. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh. Um, yeah, so that's the one way of, of trying it out, I would say. Yeah, Brill, any, anyone else want to? Yeah, I was just going to say the same. I think um, it's a very hard concept to, to figure out that because you want to say yes to everything when you start out. But when you're more established, you want to almost say no. Yeah. If everyone is biting your hand off, you aren't appropriately priced. And it's also about choosing the right clients and being a little bit more specific. So I think that's really good advice. Wow, well, okay. I, I also like, I think I'm going to disagree with you, Sam, a little bit. Okay, on, on, the, on, the, on the offering free work. Yeah, because I like I understand, but I think even even if you're a beginner, yeah, you are still worth something. So if you go to a cafe and you take shots for their menu, if you get paid twenty quid or forty quid, or yeah. you get a free meal, that might be the worth that you're giving them. Yeah, but you're still giving them some value. And as a if you're starting out as a part time photographer, that makes you feel completely different. Even like I say, even to having like a voucher for their place for twenty twenty pounds. Yeah, yeah. All of a sudden, you feel completely different doing that work. Yeah. And I think the client as well feels different. If they're getting something for free, they don't attach any value to it. I mean, I think a football club in in in, in the Premier League recently said that they're going to offer free tickets to people. Yeah. And I, I was like, that's a nice gesture, but something when it has monetary value, it has some worth. To, yeah, yeah. to someone so i think the relationship there is different even if it's very very small symbolic exchange i think it's, so it's interesting, important to interesting have it. perspective uh don't give don't give don't give bar anything yeah, I mean, free i kind of agree with what you're saying there but i also say the the free element of work is it's good for your portfolio just when, when you are yeah. really starting to understand getting getting your, your foot in the door some places i mean i shot for free for music venues uh, around where i live yeah. that's then led on to me shooting uh fairly well f uh, festivals a lot of money involved and then image theft of images that i've shot for said festivals as well that i retain copyright for and then finding those through covid and getting a nice bit of money here and there from those bits and pieces as well so <laughs> it, it's gone quite well but also those free images i used was my part of my portfolio for going to university yeah, yeah as well yeah, and i gained yeah. a lot of experience about uh networking was one because i was networking with a lot of bands and i was shooting in the venues for nothing occasionally you get some free drinks or stuff like that yeah um but then the bands would then be like oh yeah we love those photos we need some stuff for an album cover what would you charge to shoot that and then let me yeah, get on the discussions of how much do you charge for a day rate yeah and, yeah, and things like yeah. that as well and that's how i got into photography i was kind of i was fairly ill and i was photographing uh some uh some kickboxers training where i was training and a, a promoter saw me he said how much would you well, how much would you charge this is what i've got and uh, we made a bit of a deal and it was 50 quid, all the beer you can drink and, uh, <laughs> and sell your pictures to the fighters. And I came away with like 300 quid and I left my camera bag at the venue because I was so drunk. But it was, uh, <laughs> that, that, that's, just, that's just one of those things. But from those little free gigs, which don't let yourself be taken for a fool because you're shooting there on thousands of pounds worth of camera gear in some cases. And you ideally should have public liability insurance and there's wear and tear and there's your time and there's your computer software there's your computer and electricity and ultimately there's your time as well and i understand that it is nice to do but you don't want to be taken for a ride exactly as you're sort of picking up on there as well but also you do need to think about well do you have a name where people are going to be shouting about you and and offering you work out there um because that's how i gain most of my work is is through word of mouth i get ta social media for me is something I, I don't think i'll ever be able to let go of because i get so much work my workshops are all run through social media and stuff like that as well yeah so, yeah oh so i think it's also about context if you approach a client or if you approach a company um then don't expect them to pay you but if they approach you then expect them to pay you um, I don't think, like, for example, I've approached big, big companies before. We're talking like, you know, companies that could be on like the FTSE 
100 or whatever it is, like, like big, big companies. And yeah. like, hey, I want to shoot this for you. And for me to go, okay, it's going to cost eight grand for me to come and do this. That's ludicrous. I've approached them. So realize that if you're trying to get work with a certain company, then you have to, whereas you have to bend over a little bit in order yeah. for them to, you know, notice you. Yeah. And then another point I wanted to make on this whole topic was, um, sometimes it can negatively impact the whole industry if you price yourself too low. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. So I've actually had it a few times where I've gone, okay, my rates are this for that. And then they've gone, oh, well, someone else can do it for this amount. I'm like, okay, then, well, they're now making me look bad for having the experience and know how the yeah. equipment, etc., because they tr the, they're deliberately trying to undercut the next person. So if you're someone that's trying to undercut your competition, it's not going to win you any friends yeah. in the industry. So just remember that there are industry rates. There is a sort of somewhat of a rate that you should be sort of sticking by. Um, of course, you can deviate from it slightly, but if anything, realize that if you're charging something, chances are you can charge a little bit more than that anyway. So oh, there's a good analogy within uh, like my remit where um, it's uh, Mr. Smith was called up. This uh, uh, big cruise liner was stuck. They couldn't get the engine going. You might have heard it. So they call up Mr. Smith. It costs 50,000 pounds, Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith rocks up. He takes a look around. He puts a screwdriver on a nail and he hits it. And the ship starts. And they go, we pay 50 grand. You've been here for 10 minutes. He went, no, no, no. I've been doing this for 50 years. You're paying for my 50 years to know where to hit that. So I, I, I would agree, like knowing your worth and the skills you can bring. Going back to the self-awareness, I always use that analogy. And if a, if a client isn't willing to respect that, then it's, the, the chances are it's not a client you want to deal with in the future anyway. So I just wanted to jump in there um, to argue with you a little bit. <laughs> We've got um, a debate. No, I think it's I think it's a perfect point and completely valid and very true. But at the same time, when you're starting out, no one tells you what those rates are, so it's impossible to figure out. And yeah. everyone's so hush hush about it um, that it's like, well, how much should I charge? And we're like still figuring that out now at our, at our level. We're like, well, what would someone else price that at? Yeah. So it gets to a certain point um, where you have to just be happy. Um, with your own prices irrespective of what everyone else is doing yeah um so i mean yeah like of course if if you're charging 50 quid and the next person's charging um like a thousand obviously that's not doing the industry any favors for sure um but at the end of the day that person was happy to do the job for 50 quid yeah for whatever reason yeah it's an interesting aspect no i was just going to say like just de demonstrating how it is a bit of a secretive thing we're all sitting here talking about it but you're not hearing many figures because contractual like yeah, are, yeah, we can't yeah. either talk about it or you know it's it it, it is <laughs> it is relatively it is a relatively sensitive thing so how much are you charging day rate <laughs> I mean, again, because I don't want to be the guy that doesn't talk about it, I, I, I want to demystify it and I totally get where you're coming from. So currently, I um, for, so, so my day is six hours, my half day is three hours for photo or video. And the day is 850, so for six hours, it's 850 pounds. And then for three hours, it's 550. And then editing, of course, anything like that, travel, etc., is charged on top of that. If you guys actually do want to know what, you know, a working professional would charge, that's what I charge. And normally, that's, you know somewhat actually even what people are expecting to pay or even a little bit less than what people are expecting to pay especially agencies and stuff yeah. so yeah. i'd say for your day it should be anywhere between 850 to a thousand pounds depending on experience any lower than that then of course that might just be because you're not you know as experienced as such but then we get into the sort of you know gear higher that then changes things and stuff i have all my own gear i own my, all my own gear but if you're renting equipment then of course charge that as another cost so yeah i don't want to be the guy that says oh you should be doing this and not tell you so yeah is that is that cool okay that's cool respect yeah that's great i respect that so james james has got a yeah i just wanted to add to that just very quickly um yeah. You also have to trust yourself when you're starting out that you'll find your own way with prices. It might feel terrifying, but um, we found ourselves at, at similar prices, not knowing what everyone else is charging and not feeling entirely comfortable um, knowing exactly what we should be charging. Yeah. So yeah, just have a bit of faith in yourself that you'll trust where you are, how much is your time is worth and yeah. So we've got to wrap it up. We'll finish off with- uh... Just a very last quick point on that. Uh, my personal standpoint on it is there's three main factors to consider. You've got your overheads, because you've got to be able to make money. 
Yep. You've got to know what the market's doing, what everybody else is roughly costing you. You don't have to know exactly, but you need to know what you're competing against because obviously no client's going to hire you if you are a thousand pounds more expensive than another client, for example. Yeah. But also you've got to know where you stand in your industry as well. Um, not everybody can charge the same rates because not everybody has the same level of experience, the same equipment, etc. So a beginner should never charge a day rate of 850 because you know, like they just don't have that level of understanding. That's yeah. that comes with time. And like you guys said, your rate increases as your experience grows and you guys are doing that organically. And uh, I think that's what everybody yeah. does. Yeah. Uh, and that's why you can't give a definitive answer because it, there isn't one. It's, it's quite regional time. as well. Um, of course it is. Yeah, different massive. regions, there's different availability. Space. Thank you for putting that information out there. It's quite bold. Uh, yeah. Unfortunately, we have run out of time. The venue is closing. We've gone over. Um, I'd just like to... Uh, Thank everybody who, who came here to sit today. Um, for uh, everyone, I'm just going to address everyone. The, uh, our, our ambassadors um, are here, uh, uh, Bartree and Stories, because they actually got a booked gig uh, tomorrow. So everyone else will be here tomorrow. Of course, it is free to book and come down. And I'm sure we can discuss all day uh, the topics that we've got here or any questions that you might have had that didn't get answered. Um, a couple of the guys so, um, are, are running workshops as well, and they're all on uh, Eventbrite, so you're able to book in and, and find out various subjects and everything else. Um, I'd just like to say uh, from for myself and from Format High Tech, a massive thank you to you guys for coming and providing this uh, wonderful insight and expertise. It's, it's, uh, I think we could debate for the rest of, with, with a couple of beers and, and, and some food, we could probably debate for the, for the entirety of the night. Um, but uh, if we could just give them a massive round of applause, because... Uh, And uh, thank you ever so much. Thank you. Uh, I, I think we're, we're literally being kicked out now. So thank you for your time.